Welcome, welcome everyone who's joining. We are so glad to have you here for our careers on Paycheck with a Purpose, Careers and in Impact Investing. Mutaki, Cecilia, Doreen, Grant, Jefferson, Tejas, Victoria, University. Really glad to have you here. Um, we are really in store. Uh, we have a really great webinar in store for you and um, are excited that you're here. If you want to let us know in the chat where you're joining from, it's always fun to see uh, the spread of where everyone's based. My name is Jennifer Bongora. I'm Nexford University's Director of Career Innovation, and I am calling in today from the long way in Malawi, and um, excited you'll see soon where our, our panelists are joining from. We will go ahead and I'm going to launch this poll so we can get some great insights on uh, your experience in impact investing. Let me just see, do we have it? Where's our little poll? Um, but yes, if you want to let us know where you're joining from, that'll be great to see. If you have any questions, um, <laughs> thank you, Pataki, that's wonderful. Um, please do put them in the Q&A and we will be sure to cover those uh, at the end or during if we have time. I'm not, maybe I'm not seeing our poll for this time, so I'm so sorry. Um, and if you want to let us know, yeah, so keep the questions coming in the Q&A and then we'll have a better understanding of your experience with impact investing. So we have folks joining from Zambia, from Cameroon, we have India. This is a diverse crew, which is super exciting. Uh, I think it's been a while since I've seen someone join from Cameroon. So we will go ahead and uh, Joshua from Nigeria, that's great. We will go ahead and get started and I'll ask um, our panelists to go ahead and come off camera and we can um, launch in. So Ariel, uh, like I said, I'm from Jennifer Bongra from Nexford University and we are really thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar with Pollinate Impact and Ariel Molino, who's the chief, convening, uh, chief convener with Pollinate Impact. And she really has convened us together here for this, this great webinar today. So Ariel, if you wanna take it away and introduce yourself and Pollinate Impact, that would be wonderful. Awesome, thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you so much to our panelists and to all of you who are joining us today. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm the chief convener with Pollinate Impact. I'm usually based in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, but I'm currently on the road. <laughs> um, Pollinate Impact is a member-led network of impact incubators across the global South. And one of the biggest challenges that we've understood in this space with the incubators we work with and with the organizations that we work with is the, the talent flow um, of getting good, young, ambitious folks to work in these impact sectors. And what we've understood is most most of us who have ended up in this space sort of had fallen into it by accident. So Audrey and Nora and Toyin and Junior, I'll be curious to see if, if your path was more intentional. Um, and when we started talking with Jennifer at Nexford about what we could do in the talent space, we really wanted um, to start building a more uh, constructive pathway to get young folks and early professionals and students um, aware of the careers that are available in the impact industry. So we were really excited to kick off this, uh, this theory. And today we're really diving into impact investing. Last month we dove into impact incubation and next month we're talking about impact entrepreneurship. So um, we're really kind of at, at, a, at a midway point, I would say, with, with this and really excited to have our speakers and really excited to um, hopefully encourage more of you into impact careers in the future. So please ask a lot of questions. We have a really, really stellar set of folks joining us today. Um, so thank you so much. And, and back to you, Jennifer. Wonderful. Thank you. And so um, we'll take the, a moment now to just, I'll say, you know, who was joining us, and then I will love for our guests to introduce themselves, really, and tell us, you know, a little bit more about um, maybe their present past uh, sort of scenario for their career, so what they're doing now and, and what led them there. And then over our conversation in this webinar, I think we'll uncover more about their paths and, and the full journey. Um, so we have Audrey Sellian, who's the director of Artha Impact. Um, 
and we have Nora Koigi Ngare, who's the director of Deal Flow Facility with FSD Uganda. We have Toyin Emmanuel Olubake, who is an investment director with Novastar Ventures. And we have Kana Mujire Bichura Jr., who is the Deal Flow Manager with Catapult. Um, if you feel like you are at a star-studded event, then the feeling is shared because I genuinely, I mean, I just even really am enjoying looking at our <laughs> our screen here of the, the images. It's really an incredible group of, of folks who are working across the entire, you know, impact investing ecosystem. So um, to get us started, Audrey, I'll turn it over to you. And if you can share with everyone a little bit more about who you are, what you do, um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, so I'm Andre Sillian. I'm with Arthur Impact at Rianza Capital. Uh, Arthur is a dedicated um, advisory um, service to a single family office. And I've been with the group since 2006. And uh, we have been involved in uh, the direct development of a uh, portfolio of investments that have been entirely focused on social entrepreneurship, mission-driven businesses across a number of choice sectors in India. Uh, the roots of the family office are Indian, hence the emphasis geographically. And um, it's been a process of uh, building essentially access and networks and an understanding of models, notably in agriculture, health, and education that are mission-driven and scalable. And the kind of capital that we provide is, um, it's equity capital, so we're not a grant maker per se, uh, but we've realized um, that there's still a dearth of patient capital uh, that supports entrepreneurial models as they evolve and develop. A lot of these organizations are early stage. Uh, our ticket sizes were a lot smaller about 15, 16 years ago, but have grown a little bit over time. And um, above all, I guess the main point I'd make is that in anyone in these positions involved in any of these portfolios will very quickly realize in almost every market that there's a, a really rich ecosystem of peers. And it may not be very concentrated in the beginning. It may not be so developed, but they're there. And one of our goals is to identify our peers and work in concerted, coordinated ways with them to the extent we can, even though that runs a little bit contrary sometimes to how many investors and investment funds function. So I'll stop there. That's great, thank you so much. That's, uh, yeah, looking forward to digging in more. So Nora, could you come on to share a little bit more about who you are and what you do, what FSD Uganda does? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer, and good afternoon, morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. So as Jennifer said, my name is Nora Kwegingare, and I currently lead the deal flow facility at FSD Uganda. So my background in um, finance, specifically investment management, I've been in the industry for quite a long time. Uh, so I currently run the deal flow facility. So financial sector deepening is what we call a think and do tank that is specifically mandated to work in financial inclusion for the least, the most marginalized groups in Uganda. So what we do is we promote access to quality, low cost financial products and services for these groups, and also creating opportunities for Ugandans to become economically self-sufficient. So the deal for facility, which is the program that I run specifically, is an EU, European Union funded program whose mandate is to work with Ugandan enterprises to support them to get investment ready and to match them with investors. So how this relates specifically to impact investing is that we look at impact investing as two prongs. One, there's the element of providing actual finance, which is critical for businesses to thrive. But along with finance, there's a very critical element called value creation, which is essentially ensuring that these businesses are one, able to absorb the capital that they need to thrive, and two, also to be able to grow their businesses to the next level. So the deal flow facility specifically focuses on the value creation element of it through supporting entrepreneurs with various ways of, of growth. Essentially, we do a lot of technical assistance, we do mentoring, we do coaching, to 
really ensure that these enterprises are able to get to the next level of growth. Additionally, the deal flow facility is also an ecosystem convener because one of the things that we're trying to solve for is a fragmented ecosystem, specifically when you're looking at the Ugandan investment space. So what this means is essentially bringing all the parties related to a transaction on the table. So that's the entrepreneurs, the investors, the business development services that are needed by these enterprises to actually get to the point where they're investable, as well as industry associations that will actually do the convening for us. So we do the two things through financial sector deepening and essentially that's that's what I do. That's my day job. Thank you. Remarkable. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So next up we have Toyin, I believe, right? So Toyin, uh, could you come on and share a little bit more about what your work looks like as an investment director with Novastar Ventures? Sure. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. And it's great to be here again. Um, thanks to you and Ariel and Nexford for putting this together. Um, so I work as an investment director with Novastar Ventures, as you mentioned. Um, Novastar is a venture capital fund manager. So not actually an impact fund manager, but I'll come to that later. We're a Africa focused VC. Um, and our strategy has always been to understand the livelihoods of the lower, lower middle income um, people on the continent and catalyze fast growing ventures that we think can have a transformative social impact on their livelihoods. And so even though we're a venture fund, uh, we only make investments that will have catalytic, that we believe can have catalytic social impact. Um, and the group of people that we look to have that impact on are, we describe as the many, and you can think of that as, as, as I mentioned earlier, the middle income, lower middle income sort of people on the continent. And primarily as investors, um, the way we do that is by providing mostly equity investments to these companies at an early stage. We can invest in companies across different stages, so from pre-seed to sort of early growth, but we tend to invest around what's described as the Series A when a business has a bit of um, revenue traction and has proven its product in the market. Um, and beyond just bringing the investment capital, we really consider ourselves to be partners to these businesses. And so we really um, come alongside the entrepreneurs to journey with them, help solve problems, help them unlock growth, help them grow into new markets, help them when they are raising funds subsequently, subsequent to our investments and bring in other investors, um, a range of different ways. We're usually also on the boards of these companies that we've invested in. Um, and now, Going forward, Novstar is adding another lens of impact, which will be climate impact, but it will still be um, climate impact along with the social impact. So it will be looking for businesses that are not only having that transformative social impact for the many, but doing it in a way that's helping them to adapt to climate change, build resilience to climate change, helping to contribute towards um, carbon sequestration or climate um, um climate change mitigation as well in different ways. And so, and we will be doing that across Africa. Um, we've been doing that mostly in East and West Africa, the social impact investing or, or the VC with social impact screen. Um, and so, yeah, that, that kind of gives a segue into what my role is like. I'm based in Novastar's Lagos office um and helping to make investments once we've made investments helping to support the companies that we've invested in in a lot of those ways i've mentioned um and also spending a lot of a bit of time in the ecosystem as well helping um you know we filter through a lot of different folks that we speak to to see who's the best fit for our fund so there's a lot of work that goes on there as well um, and yeah, happy to dig into it more in the course of the conversation. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that great overview. Um, so Junior, if you could come on and share more about what your work is like as a deal flow manager with Catapult. Um, thank you, Jennifer and um, Ariel for putting this together and uh, having me uh, here. It's quite an honor, especially that my co-panelists are definitely 
significantly much more experienced than I am. Uh, I'll get to explain why. My name is Junior Hanamagire. I am Rondon. I'm based out of Kigali, a deal flow manager for Catapult Africa. And my my history when it comes to entering this space is a, is a bit more colorful. Um, it's not the pure finance getting to investment space. My background is quite colorful. Started off as a civil engineer in South Africa for over 12 years, where I've worked on various uh, real estate and development projects, even in some mining construction. But at a very early stage, I found myself the, uh, finding solutions and gaps and starting my first my first startup in South Africa when I was 24 years old. Um, one of the reasons why I believe I was chosen is because I have failed about three times in business. So I do have the scars and the stripes for it. Um, and it wasn't un um, until I came back to Rwanda in 2014 that my journey as an entrepreneur really took over and I actually became known by the name of my startup. Some people in this town know me as Mr. Pikiwash over my real name. Um, I've also... I also did a stint in, in in the entrepreneurship support organization, worked for a Nairobi-based ESO called AMI, African Management Institute, that has a big focus on trying supporting entrepreneurs, um, mostly MSMEs and SMEs, but also eventually extended to um, the startup ecosystem. And it wasn't until two years ago when the opportunity of Catapult came along, I jumped along um, pretty much to try to understand how the ad side thinks. Well, um, I had quite experience as a founder, uh, as most founders, I went on pitching to hundreds of investors being told no 99% of the time. And it wasn't until the opportunity of Catapult came along um, that I jumped on it. It was really going back to school as far as I'm concerned, trying to understand the rationale of how invested, impact investors uh, work. Now, to talk a bit about Catapult, um, Catapult started, up, started off as a an association of wealthy investors out of oh, out of Oslo and Norway that really found a gap in uh, the need for um, capital investment in the ocean tech space. About eight years ago, that was still a bit of a greenfield um, um, area. There wasn't a lot of investment specifically dedicated to ocean tech, but eventually they set up Catapult as a venture capitalist fund manager that would then raise money from wealthy individuals and family offices to invest in climate tech and ocean tech startups. Um, five years down the line, they quickly realized that 30% of the investments were done on the African continent and a decision was made to dedicate a specific uh, vertical for um, for investing on the continent, which is how the Kigali office uh, was launched in February 2022. I think I was higher number two or three, uh, where we pretty much decided to see how we could learn from the successes of the operation of the group in Oslo and duplicate them on the continent. Um, I came in as a deal flow manager pretty much to say that I am involved in the entire process, starting from scouting and sourcing, uh, due diligence, uh, investment committee presentation, deal structuring and negotiation, all the way to actually dispersing the capital. And uh, we've had quite a bit of success since we launched in 2022. We've made 17 investments. The idea is to make an additional 15 next year, um, mostly focusing on sectors of agri-tech and food tech. So the Vertical and climate tech, sorry. So agri-tech, food tech, and climate tech. So the vertical in Africa only specifically focuses on these three areas. And we've invested in quite a wide range of companies um, that are really within the ecosystem of those specific sectors. Um, one thing to mention also, and the reason why Ariel and I are connected, is that we have an accelerator program that we design in-house. We only We only accelerate companies in our portfolios um, and our accelerator program is a three months um, program that looks at three specific pillars, um, impact, growth, and investment readiness. And these three pillars really prepare our portfolio companies um, towards what we call a demo day where we get to invest, to introduce our, our, our investees and our portfolio companies to a network of 200 plus co-investors, really helping our portfolio companies really raising follow-up capital fairly quickly uh, after the completion of the Accenture program. Now, what I meant to say that it threw me in the deep end was the equivalent of being thrown in a pool with both feet tied to a concrete block. I really had to hit the ground running. Um, I'm very fortunate that I have a very, very supporting, supporting team here in Kigali, but also in Oslo, and which really accelerated the learning curve. And um, I have to say it's been a fun journey. So I'm looking forward to sharing as much as I can. It's truly remarkable. 
And not that this, there's not a competition here, but I think this might win as our most geographically diverse webinar by panelists and guest, <laughs> guest uh, participants. So it's, it's so cool to see um, the breadth and depth and scope of the work that you all are doing globally from India to Uganda, being based in Rwanda and Nigeria, but of course, um, investing in companies across the continent and then you know globally with um, Audrey. So for this webinar, it's just so helpful when we find that, uh, you know, peeling back the layers on what careers look like, because what I find, I, you know, oversee our career services support for Nextford University. Sometimes you see people's LinkedIn profiles or you see the posts on social media and it looks like you were um, you know, just born into being an impact investor and that this is the way it's always been. And, and I, um, I'm i not pitching anyone here on an alternate uh, LinkedIn platform, but sometimes I feel like we need, a, you know, the layers between and, you know, Junior's talking about failing three times before <laughs> landing where he is now. So you all have shared about what you're, um, you know, who you are, the organizations that you work with. It's so helpful. I think it's interesting too. Hopefully we'll have time to dig in to what Toyin is saying and how um, Nova Star Ventures doesn't necessarily, if I understood correctly, you know, identify as an impact investor, but their, um, the work that they're doing aligns uh, definition wise with what impact investing does. So I think that's interesting. There's a lot of nuance in this space. But to, if you could give us this, you know, a highlight of what really did it look like for you to get where you are? And maybe this is this current one and it sounds, you know, you've shared bits and pieces of it. But, you know, when did you first hear about impact investing or were you more interested in being in the venture capital space? Did you know people who worked in this area? Um, can you give a little bit more color to how this career path even came into your awareness. Nora, you look like you are ready. You're moving, you got, <laughs> may I take it, send it to you? <laughs> sure, okay. happy to share. So very early in my career, actually straight out of uni, I received possibly what's been the best advice ever career-wise that has stuck with me to this day and still remains essentially a guiding light. So my mentor at the time told me to pick an industry, not a role. Because if you pick an industry over a role, what you'll end up with is a career and not a job. So how I interpreted that was to be very open-minded in terms of looking for new opportunities and also looking longer term in terms of where I want to be and to plan for how to get there based on where I am. So I started my career in about 2006. I was just about to finish university and I literally sent applications to every single bank in Nairobi, in Kenya at the time. I think there were about 42 or 44 banks and I received a response from exactly one. So I essentially fell into my career by, by fate. So I started out in commercial banking treasury, trading foreign exchange and fixed income. Then I did this for about five years across three countries in Kenya, in Rwanda, and in Nigeria. Then it was a really high pressure job and I realized it was aging me before my time. So I needed to, to do something else. But the downside of this was that being a very specialized space, the skills were not highly transferable. So I needed to retrain. So I moved to South Africa, got my postgrad at the University of Cape Town, and then started working in corporate finance, which again, I fell upon accidentally because one of my professors was looking for an associate. So I ended up in corporate finance. So I did this for about, about four years. And at that time, I started to feel the need to go back home to Kenya. So I'm from Nairobi. So I started actually researching what was out there in the investment space because I'd caught the investment bag and I was very interested in staying within the investment space. So that's how I stumbled upon impact investing based on my research. So I actively started looking for roles in the impact investing space, specifically in um, East Africa. I was open to anywhere in East Africa, but my preference was for Kenya. 
So in 2015, I moved back to Kenya and I started working for what is now called C4D Partners, Capital for Development Partners. Then it was called Eco Investments and we managed a fund for Rabobank, which was an agri fund. So that was my first exposure to impact investing. And it was incredible because it was, I mean, it may sound a bit cliche, but actually seeing the value of the investments that you make in terms of improving people's lives really changed me. And I realized that this is what I wanted to do long term. Then, um, so I stayed on on this role and it was very interesting. We got to do some very exciting stuff across the region because this, re this role was covering um, five Eastern African countries, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, DRC, uh, Tanzania, and I think Burundi, so six countries. So getting to work with different entrepreneurs, different value chains, different sectors, and actually seeing how investing in this business has a trickle down effect to one, the suppliers of this business, be they smallholder farmers or their customers and how they're actually able to improve their lives in terms of improved income was incredible. Additionally, seeing that the investments that we were making had a direct environmentally positive impact was also really, really rewarding. So it was the first time I was coming across actual physical impact. So that was very exciting. So unfortunately, the fund I was working for decided to move to Asia. Now, remember, I had just moved back to East Africa, so I wasn't willing to move to Asia. So I started looking for, for something else. So that's when it dawned on me, or rather I discovered that impact investing was actually a lot broader than I thought. You could do it directly in companies, or you could do it directly, indirectly through financial institutions, essentially providing funding to financial institutions who would then own lend to their clients, thereby creating additional impact. So that was very uh, broadening in terms of opening my horizons. And I joined an impact fund manager called Triple Jump that was uh, essentially um, lending to financial institutions. So that was super interesting, got to work across different countries, um, all of sub-Saharan Africa that was English speaking, as well as a couple of countries in the Middle East. So that was also quite eye-opening and also increased my exposure. And so in 2018, I think it was, I got headhunted by financial, by um, Finance in Motion, which is a German impact asset manager, to essentially set up the, to, to be part of the team that started their operations, the invest, impact investing operations in Kenya. And so that was quite exciting. I got to do that. And um, that's when I realized that impact investing was not just providing capital. There was also, like I mentioned earlier, the value creation element of it, because we would essentially invest in the business, but also provide some technical assistance post-investment to ensure this business has had a high chance of success. So I thought that, again, going back to my mantra of picking an industry rather than a role, it would be very beneficial to be an all-rounder, because I've got this solid experience in actually deploying the capital. I also needed to have solid experience in value creation to, be, to become a holistic individual um, in professional in the impact investing space. So when financial sector deepening came calling about two and a half, almost three years ago, it was perfect because it was now getting to work on the other half of the equation, which is value creation. So that's, that's what I currently do. That's my journey. It's been very exciting. And I'm glad to say that Picking an industry rather than a role gave me a career that I can proudly speak of. Thank That's you. wonderful. Thank you so much, Nora. I'm curious, um, you know, even from this group, from, from my understanding in the venture capital space, you, people who then go in to work on the venture capital side rather than receiving the funds, um, you know, maybe you're coming from a background, of the finance background, you've been an investment banker, worked um, in, in the investment space. And or you've been an entrepreneur, a founder, failed, succeeded, exited, and then you want to get on the other side because you understand that experience. So I'm curious, Toyin, um, you know, I know we have a lot of the angles here, but Toyin, you've 
it looks like, at least from LinkedIn, I could be totally missing, uh, I'm sure, lots of pockets of your life, but you've come, um, you, know, you studied mechanical engineering, um, coming in, probably it looks like with the technical expertise, and then also moving into that finance side, but have you been a founder? And then what got you to this track or, you know, where you are now with Novastar Ventures? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, actually, my my story starts out quite similar to Nora's, which which was actually quite inspiring to listen to. So, um, right after I graduated, um, or right actually right before I graduated, I had worked with Siemens on a placement. Um, and I enjoyed the placement, but I graduated knowing that I didn't want to work in a core engineering role, and so I then took a year out to try and think about you know what strengths that I think I had. And, you know, where did I think that would place me? What interest did I had? Obviously, I was a graduate, so I didn't really know what interests I had per se. Um, fortunately, I worked with a couple of friends who were studying entrepreneurship at Nottingham. And Nottingham had, like, I guess what you would describe as an incubator um, for, for alumni or students who wanted to start businesses. So um, I worked with a couple of entrepreneurs in that year. We tried to launch a couple of ideas. And none of them took off. <laughs> but um, so um, coming out of that, I kind of felt like finance was a great place for me to focus on. I saw the need that entrepreneurs would have to access capital and how difficult it could be. Um, and with my engineering background, I was quite comfortable on the numerate side. And so it was kind of like a simple, simple sort of triangulation at that point. Um and then started to get some finance qualifications. And I studied in the UK. So in, at this point, I was still in the UK. And then a couple of years later, I moved back to Nigeria. Um, and that's when I started my career, my professional career properly. Um, I joined an investment bank. Um, and intentionally, I joined a generalist invest, um, in, investment bank. Um, because I didn't quite get the, the sagely advice that Nora did. But Similarly, I thought that, um, you know, especially having invested a couple of years in, in, in building skills that I didn't feel like I was going to apply directly as a mechanical engineer, I felt like it would be great to build as much understanding and expertise as I could as a generalist. And then, you know, if I find an area that I feel is very, very particularly sort of calling out to me, then I can dive in as a specialist there. But what I found along the way was that, you know, there are a lot of transferable skills in finance and the way you apply them may vary. But at the core, there are a lot of, you know, similar skills in terms of how you do financial analysis, how you think about commercial analysis and, you know, a lot of the different things that come in. And so I I, I liked to stay generalist. And then um, after about nine years doing investment banking, I got the opportunity to join a uh, a first time agriculture focused fund manager. And this was around the time that the impact piece started to come in for me. So I had done the investment banking, enjoyed working where I worked and the people I worked with. Um, but I did start to feel like um, I wanted to see more impact from my work. And I understood the impact from being able to catalyze businesses that are serving communities. But you know, it was, uh, we were serving extremely commercially oriented businesses and, and even some governments. And, um, and so I got to a point where also seeing what was just happening in the environment around me, um, at, uh, um, I felt like I needed to be a lot more intentional about, you know, the coinc coinciding my, my work and my skills with areas of impact. And so the opportunity to join the Agriculture Fund just spoke to me in that way, because even though, again, it was it was a fund that very intentionally did not identify as an impact fund. It's a, it's a, a, a private equity fund, um, but it's investing in agriculture businesses, mostly SMEs in Nigeria. Um, and even where we would be investing in commercial farms. A lot of times those commercial farms would directly be working with smallholder farmers because they needed the inputs that those farmers would provide. And so it 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 gave me a way to kind of bring the impact and the, the skills I'd built on the finance side together. Um, and so I was with that fund. Um, and then the opportunity came 
to join another fund doing similar thing. But that then that was a fund that was Impact First, Acumen Fund, their global fund. Um, and I had the opportunity to join them, their team in West Africa. And then, you know, looking beyond Nigeria, looking beyond agriculture, a couple of different sectors. Acumen was different because, like I said, Acumen puts impact first. And, you know, Acumen had, has a very specific approach and focus. So um, for those who may not know, the approach is to leverage a lot of philanthropy that would usually be given as aid. But rather than giving that as aid, which can be very, very um, distorting to markets, would be to then invest in early stage businesses that would be that would struggle to raise commercial capital. So you're still sort of bridging a, a meaningful gap there. Um, and especially where those businesses were serving or engaging low income communities. And so that gave me the opportunity to kind of put the impact front and center and see what that was like um, with one of the pioneers in that space, which um, I did for about four years. And then um, um, the opportunity to, to, to join Novastar came along. And like I explained earlier, because Novastar has that um, impact lens that's intrinsic to how we operate, even though it was a, a VC fund, um, I felt like it was it was sort of like a natural progression as well. And yeah, I've described how Novastar operates, but in terms of how how the career transition came in, that's that's what it was for me. I did want to kind of be in this space, but the journey was not direct. And initially, I wasn't thinking as much about the impact, but that kind of came on to me um, as a, as a strong focus to add add on to my career journey um, um, while I was doing investment banking and have had the opportunities to bring that in. That's remarkable. Thank you so much. So what I heard, I, like what I'm hearing you say, and that I think a lot of people, no matter what industry they're in, is this realization um, of the importance of your own personal values intersecting with your professional interests and path. And I think a lot of people who are unhappy in their careers it's not that you're only can you know follow your passion and follow your heart but really first understanding what it is that gets you excited and where you find meaning and then how you can find that um in your work it's very hard to find that and it sounds like you have <laughs> but yeah it's wonderful um i wonder Audrey and Junior, I mean, I know in the interest of time, this is, it's really, it's just remarkable hearing about how people um, move through different roles. And I think um, the, the great value in a lot of these webinars that we host is just the opportunity for people to see, again, that people are not stepping out of university and into the investment director job at Novastar, <laughs> Novastar Ventures, um, leading, you know, $80 million portfolio, uh, although that'd be great. Uh, but that there are a lot of steps along the way and uh, interactions that people are having and incubator or, you know, failed experiments happening with friends and co-founders um, and to, to lean into that curiosity. So I'm curious, you know, Audrey and Junior, I want to hear more about your experience, but also I'm sure people are constantly turning to you, asking you, where can I find a job in impact investing? How can I build skills in this space? Um, how can I launch my career? So I'm wondering when people come to you with those questions and um, we can start junior and then move to Audrey, where are you turning them to? Are there, and we have a question in the Q&A about this, but are there specific job sites that you recommend to people that you've, you've used yourselves? You know, Nora, I heard you say that you're, you got headhunted, Toyin, an opportunity presented itself. Like, what does that look like in practice? Are recruiters just reaching out to you constant, <laughs> constantly? And if so, is there something that you would recommend to people to do on, you know, on their own LinkedIn profiles so that they can get recognized or again, build the experience? Um, but Junior, we'll start with you and then move over to you, Audrey. What do you think? Um, My response is gonna be pretty, pretty quick and short, but what I've observed over the years is one, the impact invest investing space in Africa is grow it's a, it's a field that is growing really fast. I think the, the the number of new entrants in the investment ecosystem on the continent has accelerated exponentially and mostly thanks to um 
surprisingly new approach. A lot of funds of funds or uh, DFIs or institutional funders are targeting uh, first time young African fund managers, um, which is a good news, which is good news for anybody who's looking at entering the, the, the field. I mean, um, the number of new funds that have just been introduced by um, the African Growth Fund with Massacre Foundation is is quite astonishing, and what they plan to do in the next four to five years is is very exciting. So, for anybody who's looking at entering this field, that's definitely um, a way to keep an eye out on the ecosystem is to find out who are the new fund managers and what are they up to. Um, what I could also add when it comes to entering the field, my my my. My history in entering this this sector is actually quite funny. It was mostly an opportunity. Um, I was at a point in my career where I knew, having been a founder, having been a founder, having failed as as many times as I did, what were the gaps as far as technical support and investment needs founders need needed. But for me to be able to have an impact was to first understand um, how the investment work world works. A joke that I I went back to school um when I when I joined Catapult because I really had to unlearn a lot of things that I had picked up as a founder, as an engineer, and 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 with my very limited finance background. Uh, the the intention behind most of the impact um, funders fund managers is a hundred percent most of the time a hundred percent pure uh, from the founders especially. African founders' perspective, it can be a frustrating source of you a source of frustration when you you feel like all you're being asked to do is just to report on impact metrics, which is usually the uh, the priority for these impact investors. But what I've learned very quickly into this role was that trying to find a way to explain to founders the reason and the, and the reasoning behind why is it important for you to keep track on your impact metrics and why is it important for impact investors. As a very good way to um to really help these founders find a lot of funding and catalyst uh, 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 find the right type of funding for for these startups. Now, for aspiring entrant uh, aspiring uh, professional entering the investment field, the same advice I give to founders that I speak to is trying to understand the the agenda, the impact agenda of these impact investors because they all have different ones. Uh, in the case of Catapult, we are an impact investor first. Yes, we have a venture capitalist fund manager. But the impact is very at the forefront of what we do. And anybody who would want to work with us will really do well to understand our priorities, for example, when it comes to the ivory tech sector. What are we trying to achieve? Um, and if if they get to understand that, for example, what is very important for us is to mitigate as much as we can um post harvest loss, then you come in at a very at a very powerful uh, angle to to have a chance to work with Pelopos. Fortunately, we're not hiring at the moment, uh, but we're going to be growing very fast as we're in the process of closing a much larger fund that will look at the at, at the team eventually expanding. I think I'm going to stop there. I feel like I'm going all over the place. That's great. Thank you so much, Junior. It sounds like it's um, the job search advice that I would encourage a lot of people to uh adopt which is you know identifying and i love how nora was saying that her you know the 44 banks that she applied to with in kenya but knowing you know googling what are the 44 banks in kenya making your spreadsheet what are the list of funds uh where are you wanting to work there um and then targeting them doing your research identifying those fund managers or the hiring managers you know leaders within so that's really great advice thank you junior Audrey, you're representing a real another super exciting aspect of it. So the single family foundation approach, um, where I imagine you all are not a, I mean, maybe I could be wrong. You're not a huge team, but and so what did it look like for you coming into this family foundation? And where do you turn folks to for resources um, when they ask about them? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'll share a little bit about my story, which is, uh, one of uh, no clear path, relative confusion upon graduation. And I graduated a little earlier in 1996 from college and applied to every bank I could, Nora, um, but couldn't, didn't have anyone to give me the kind of advice that you got and um, ended up getting, you know, hundreds of letters. I think I got three responses. I finally got one position and I ended up doing, do you guys remember Y2K testing? 
1999 when they thought that the computers were all going to explode because of the numbers. <laughs> so I did mind numbing, soul destroying work in a, at that time it was um, the freshly merged Price Waterhouse Coopers. And it was, a, it was an utter um, just shock. I mean, you're as a young person, you have some hope and some, <laughs> some sense of you want to find purpose and then you end up doing projects like that for months on end. And you're like, okay, this is completely meaningless. And why am I put on this earth? So um, my, my journey was a little bit more roundabout because I had a complete existential crisis after a couple of years of that. And I thought I had been to, I'm originally of Armenian origin and I got to go and visit the country um, in 1999. And there I was like, okay, I want to do something else. I have to do something, you know, development tied to development so my my response was to run back to graduate school and then ended up um trying to i thought the answer was getting something inside the united nations or under usaid because i i, I knew people there it was a very roundabout circuitous journey and um so what i'm going to share is like probably the least helpful thing ever because i i didn't even know what a single family office was uh when i bumped into one. The good news is that um, this ecosystem today is so much more concentrated and vibrant and identifiable. There's so many more vehicles that are self-identified um, and very well networked inside, whether it's a venture philanthropy network, a pure philanthropy network, an investment network, an angel network. There's so many different clusterings of those who are embedding mission into the their 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 tagline. Now whether or not sorry, I have a dog barking in the background. Now whether or not um that actually translates to actual meaningful mission orientation, which 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 necessitates truly a mind shift. Um and I, and I'm not sure what it is. I think it's 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 your background, it's your childhood, it's your family sensibilities, it's what you've seen in your community. Um I do think that there are so many well-intentioned investment managers out there today who are looking to hire in their own image. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that was the case earlier. Um, and the way I ended up in a family office was essentially completely by accident. But it just so happened that the person I met was saying, we want to find somebody who's interested in development, but also has some private sector experience. That's as, that's as specific as it got at that point in time. Again, good news is, you know, you 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 will be hard pressed, I think, to even go to one of these fancy private wealth Camden events or these, you know, there's the, these circuits that convene family offices on every continent, and you'll be hard pressed to attend an event and not see at least one panel, one workshop, one thematic area that's focused on, okay, you know, what's the purpose of capital? And what's the purpose of our system and why are we doing this? So um, when I meet young people today, um, first of all, and I think this is this comes back to this really lovely book that was written by Adam Grant called Give and Take, um, where you do this, he's done this incredible empirical, like historical analysis of like who ends up doing better in the end, the ones who give, like without thinking about what they're getting in return, or the ones who are, you know, opportunistic and takers. And you kind of know quick, quickly when you meet somebody how that how that flows. When I meet young people, I introduce them to every person I can possibly think of that could be useful to them. I think it's really important to do that, to try to make the links, even if it's random, even if it's just informal and social. And we, we've been doing a lot of informal convening. None of it is monetized on, under this banner of impactforbreakfast.com. And it's a system that it's just about getting people together in their cities. We did it in London. Uh, we started 15 years ago every month. And, you know, we offered tea and coffee and whatever else we had on hand. And we realized, you know, the chances of people liking each other, working together and coordinating their actions is higher when they like each other and they know each other. So we've been doing that for 15 years in London. That network grew. We set up a system. We just said, you know, whatever you're talking about in your city, just capture it somewhere so that when people are passing through, it's a pretty mobile, it becomes, whether no matter where you're coming from, it starts to become 
you feel like you can access anyone. You feel like you can you you can reach pretty much anyone who's in the in the like-minded tribe of those who who care about the same things and whose values are aligned. So now we have 34 cities in this network. We haven't done anything. It's all other people who say we want to convene in Yerevan. We want to convene in Philadelphia. We want to convene here. We say okay here. Take the system, the data is yours. Just capture what it is you're talking about and help make links because the only way is connectivity. So I don't know if that's um that's a it's a roundabout super circuitous path that I've just described, but uh, I find that um yeah that's um hopefully it's it it could be in some way helpful in terms of um, building the social capital of those who are just starting out. I love that so much. Uh, it's really helpful and I think is inspiring. I've shared the link here, impactforbreakfast.com. We will share that in the follow-up and also with the recording. Um, I've been so inspired lately, even I will say just this year of seeing people around me, you know, just wanting to start up something. Okay, I'm going to create a WhatsApp group for people who are interested in X, Y, and Z, or I have a, you know, Substack newsletter where I write about, you know, an insert niche topic, um, or I'm going to decide to, you know, host a walking group. Uh, there's a woman actually in, in, in Geneva who does this walking group that I see on Instagram. I don't know if you've seen this, who she just started out of like, I'd like to walk with other people and meet people. And now she's like hundreds of people every, you know, quarter doing it. So that's, uh, I think, um, have you seen this, Audrey, or no? no? Can you can you let me know who she is? It's a yes. small town here. Yeah, her Instagram handle is packed with no E, suitcase. Um, okay. But I think that's a, a mindset that uh, sometimes can be hard to carry in your career because, again, you look at people and you think, oh, there's the experts here, far away, unreachable. I What do I know? I'm beginning, I'm early, I am transitioning or pivoting. Um, but I think true leaders and true experts are people who are are humble and you know and what I've heard many of you mention is like recognizing when we need to upskill or um, add more to our skills to our tool belt, which I think can be a humbling ex experience in and of itself is understanding those gaps and then thinking about okay can I do something about them. <clears throat> My takeaway too, Audrey, from yours is you know not to. It can be painful at the time, but don't be afraid to have your mind numbed for a little bit because <laughs> maybe it's going to be the spark that you need. Um, again, I think so many people graduate or finish a you know a pro their education in whatever it is, a course certificate degree, and think, okay, now I will, I am prepared and I will be leading a company, which you might be. You might be a founder, you might be an entrepreneur, but there are going to be jobs sometimes that are going to teach you more about yourself, what you want, and then also what you really don't want <laughs> and how to spur you on in other directions. So I really loved what you shared everything there, Audrey and Junior. Thank you so much. And Adam Grant. Yeah. I recommend everyone follow him on his channels. So we only have, you know, a few more minutes and I have um, some questions in the Q and A. Um, I highly recommend, I'm seeing people asking to connect. I think that's also, everyone here, please, you know, look at everyone's name, look at on the um, registration, follow them on LinkedIn. Some of the best insights that I gain are for people who I'm not even connected to sometimes because I'm just following. I, I sometimes will flag, uh, you know, turn on the little bell, the notifications for people I'm really excited about so that I see posts and I, um, you know, am passively filling my feed with things that are going to be interesting to me. Um but we have questions, you know, about the best way to find impact careers. I think we've covered that. Um, we have a few additional, I think, resources. There's, um, I'll put this in the chat, PCDN Global. It's not necessarily impact investing, but impact careers for sure. And if you click on, um, uh, and Craig Zelizer leads this along with his wife, Catalina. Um, he has a mega job board of social impact job boards. So he has his own job board. And then he has, for example, companies that are B Corporation certified. Um, there's Skoll Foundation. I know, I mean, there's lots of different job boards under the resources tab. So please take a look at the, his website and we will again share that in the follow-up. Um, DevX, of course, has some, some roles, but I think those lean a little bit more development. That's not necessarily like impact investing focused. Um, 
we have a question here. Maybe, well, Junior, did you say you're an engineer? You said you're an engineer as well, right? Yeah. So we have our yep. two engineers we didn't know of. Audrey, you might be one, and I don't know it. Secret closet engineer. No? Okay. So are there technical roles that engineers who understand finance can do? I think, yes. I think you can be <laughs> you can be Toyin or, or Junior, um, among many other things. For example, assessing the investment worthiness of assets would require specific technical knowledge about the design and capabilities. How do you find these roles? Is an MBA an, MBA an, an essential qualification? Um, or what would you recommend? Oh, Jin, that's what it was. I was typing Grin. Um, so Toyin, Junior, what do you think? Are you, what do you see for technical roles for engineers who understand finance? I feel, I feel like Toyin will have a, a bit more uh, precise insight on this matter. But one thing I can share about my engineering background was that the tendency of wanting to build systems and processes around the entire um, deal flow process kind of is something that I took on at a very early stage, which I, I really do believe it comes from a deep compassion to try and build system and automate uh, activities one by one. I'm sure so you, you can relate to that. As far as very specific uh, engineering roles, uh, I want to say uh, look into asset financing and commercial capital when it comes to uh, very specific areas. Uh, we're working with um, the Shred African Bank that actually has, a, they have a mechanical engineer who's in charge of the valuation component of asset financing for companies in the agri, uh, agri space. So there are specific engineering skills um, out there. Um, I'll have to do a bit of research and maybe share with the team late, at a later stage. Um, as far as the MBA is concerned, it's it's really helped me understand the side of finance and business that I could have not been exposed in my previous career as an engineer. So um, MBA is recommendable, but it has to be the right one. My MBA was in project management, which is a continuation of my uh, my previous um, postgraduate degree into engineering. So it, it was a continuation of what I was doing, making sure the MBA is, I find it, more relevant to be to be connected to my previous career to reinforce my background in, in project management. But um, it, it could also be dictated of where you want your career to be. But so, you know, I'd like to hear your take on the on, on your engineering skills and how they've contributed to your career as an investor. investor. Thanks, Junior. I was I was smiling because that compulsion to build systems, I definitely relate with that. <laughs> um, even though I never actually practiced as an engineer. Um, I'll be quick because I know we're, we're short on time. I think, um, are there opportunities for engineers to work in finance? The short answer is yes. I don't think you necessarily need to leverage your engineering skills if you're coming in as an investor. Um, like even to, to the point that Junior made around um, like asset valuations, you'd still be needing to learn finance skills. And so I think engineering gives a great on-ramp to learning almost anything technical. Um, and so you might want to, for instance, learn financial modeling or valuation. Um, it, w one of the things I will say about um, impact invest investing in general is that um, the finance skills are not everything. You, all, you actually also need a, a good commercial understanding. Um, which is related, but actually different from the finance skills. And that was one of the first things that I learned when I got that job in private equity and the partner was explaining this to me. And I didn't it immediately get it until I started um, learning, you know, how 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 much different private equity was um, um, versus investment banking. Um, so that's 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 one thing, like think of the skills. And, and this is something that I've done through my career and I advise people a lot don't necessarily think of a role think about skill sets and so what are the skill sets that you have that could translate into um a different sort of role that you want to move into there'll probably be new skills that you need to develop and then maybe you can find short co courses and things like that to help um an mba i think is is sort of like a great standard. I think it. a lot of people consider an MBA as a great way to demonstrate you have a certain level of, of general knowledge about strategy, business development, com you know, commercial, commercial matters, finance, and so on. But it's not necessary. I don't have an MBA. 
Um, but because of the experience I have, you know, I've been, I've not, and just to be honest, great fortune, I've been able to sort of um, um, come into the investment world. But yeah, I would say in summary that um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of innate understanding that an engineer will have that can easily translate into the finance world. Um, but you probably are, are would be in a good stead to to pick up some of the commercial skills, finance skills, understanding impact in different contexts to really um, get the sort of roles you might want as a direct investor. This is great. It's like I tell my daughter when we're going to school and there's traffic one way and a different road the other, you know, we can, we're going to the same destination, but we can get there in a few different ways. So it sounds like MBA is useful for some folks um, and really important in building certain skill sets. And then also people are coming, you know, with the experience and um, good fortune sounds like too. <laughs> we are at time. I have just loved this uh, entire webinar, this conversation really, I could say. Um, Butaki, our hype woman, totally, you know, just here of her own accord, loving it, Butaki. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, we are having our third, like Ariel mentioned, we have the third in this series. So we've talked about impact incubators, um, impact investing. We'll talk about impact entrepreneurship in January, maybe 2024, you're wanting to start a business. Um, we hope you'll register. We are um, identifying, finalizing, identifying our speakers. So right now there's nothing on the page, but you can still register. We'll share a link to that in the follow-up. Um, we've heard so many interesting, you know, pieces of advice here about building a career in impact investing. Some themes I've heard are around the importance of retraining, reskilling. I heard Nora say that, I heard Junior say that. Um, understanding too, that there's an an ecosystem around every industry. So I think sometimes we go into careers and we think maybe it's a zero sum game. I'm the only one who could have this job. I'm the only one who can do this thing. You know, I heard Audrey mention how important it is for their foundation of understanding who the other players are in the space. Junior mentioned the 200 plus 